um, the internet wasn't behaving very well was I wanted to um, show some rudimentary photo editing using the GIMP, which is a free open source um, application which allows for really high level uh, professional quality uh, image manipulation. And I installed that before class and I believe it's installed in the labs. And let's go in and let's play around a little bit with the image, the background image um, of our little Browns website. I'm not going to update the Ravens page. That would simply be too painful to do this early in the morning. So remember we left off like this, all right, with this. Let's go in and, let, and again, as we, as we navigate it around. Oh, remember we talked about that Internet Explorer issue, which we'll come back to later on. Let me open this up in Chrome. And as we navigate around, we see all the pages are consistent. Let's change the background Im uh, image to be the background image of the, the little brownie. this one. So let me go in and edit my CSS. As we said before, we put the CSS in its own file, which means that to change it, we only have to change it in one place. So by simply going in and setting the file, I'm changing the background image. We can change not just one page, but all of the pages. Let me go in and make sure that file extensions are turned on so that we can be sure that we have the precise file name. All right, and then we can go back and view this, which is not what I wanted. I wanted Big Brownie. There we go. All right. Now, as you notice here, the brownie's obscured. All right. So I'm going to remove those background colors and so that the text is sitting right on top of the brownie. And I can go in here and do that simply by removing this and removing this. And I'll set these guys to orange instead of white because I have a feeling the white isn't going to look very good. All right, I do this. Now we run into the difficulty of the colors of the images interfering with the text. All right. So as much as we may like the appearance of that, it renders the page useless. Well, one of the things that we can do is through, we can, we can sort of make it almost like a watermark. You're probably familiar with watermarks like on checks or uh, other sort of official documents where you, there's an image there, but it doesn't like stand out very strongly. It's sort of a very subdued sort of um, outline almost of an image. So what I can do is I'm going to go into the GIMP and I'm going to edit this image to make it so that it's more like a watermark. So I'll go and open this, wrong one, and edit this image with the GIMP. It does take a minute to start up, especially the first time. Maybe every time. Anytime you start to think this is too long to wait, go and compare the price tag on this to the price tag of Photoshop and that will make you feel a little better. So this will come up eventually. 
in the editor. And we can go and we can play around with um, this and, and uh, change the brightness and the contrast of the image so it's less of, you know, it's less a, a vividly colored image and more of a very backgroundy kind of image. All right, so there we have the image. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into colors and I'm going to play with the brightness and contrast. And what I'm going to do is Brightness and contrast does not operate on index layers. All right, let's try this. Let me go save this as a JPEG. Not 100% sure what it's doing there, but I don't like it. So I'm going to save it as a JPEG. That it will allow me to do. And now I can go in and open up the JPEG. Notice this will no longer will no longer have a transparent background because JPEGs don't support transparency. But at least I can go in and set the brightness and contrast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the image very bright. And making it very bright has the effect of sort of washing it out. Washing it out is the word I think I was looking for before. And then if I lower the contrast or actually play with the contrast a bit to what I want. Uh, it looks like I don't want to change the contrast in this. I might even do that again and make it brighter still. And I could try it a third time if I wanted. Each time I'm making it progressively brighter and brighter so it's more faded. The idea here is so faded in fact that you cannot see it on the screen. I can actually still see it. Let's, there we go. We'll make it like that. All right. Now I'm going to go and save it. And now I'm going to change my style sheet to reflect the JPEG version of it that I just edited. So now you see, again, we may not have the best color choices yet still on the text, but now you can see the text is much, much, much more readable than it was before because we get the image sort of suggested in the background and that kind of kind of works pretty good. So that's one thing that you can do, I guess, is the bottom line, is that you can edit your image to sort of fade it a bit, to sort of wash out the colors so that it can be used. The other thing you can do is like we did initially, and let me delete this version of it and restore the original. So let me delete the version I just did and open up the zip file again and that is I can have a background image but have this have the actual text on a on a solid color background and that's something that you can do that's effective there's a number of things that you can do too to like match colors. For example, 
maybe I want the orange in this to match the orange in that. Well, I could play with those numbers to try to get it, but that could be difficult. The GIMP and other editing, photo editing tools have the ability to go in and I can use a little eyedropper to grab that color. So I'll go, I'm going to press on the eyedropper and I'll press on that. And then when I look, it will show me the HTML notation for that color of orange. There we go. So that represents that color orange. So I could go and get it to match. And I, I don't have to eyeball it. I can get a precise match if that's what I want. All right, so now notice that that color matches exactly. All right. Another thing that you can do is you can tile images. All right. What do I mean by tile? You notice that um, in the first example that if you just make a background image, it repeats it. It repeats it horizontally and it repeats it vertically. And we can control that if we want. Um, like in this case, I only have it repeating the one time. But sometimes you can use a nice tile effect to sort of get a mosaic. And it's almost like putting floor tiles in, if any of you have ever done that, you know, where as each individual tile has a little pattern, but when the, the tiles are laid side by side, it interlocks and forms a bigger pattern. So let's go out and Google some background tiles. Uh, GIMP. Yeah, GIMP.org. And it's free, yeah. So I'll just go CSS tile background and Here's a free image tile generator. That's pretty cool. So I can go in and I can say I want the image to be hundred pixels. Yeah, let's not use this one. Let's use this one instead. Yeah, this is the one I've used. So I can go and I can make, let's say I like that design. I can download that image. And it's called pattern.png. I will put that in my folder. And I can go in and I can edit the style sheet to use that. Ah, I still have the no repeat attribute on. So I'll say, I'll eliminate that, and that will tell it to repeat it. And then I get that. So notice how that one tile, sort of, when it's put side by side, it's like, it's like putting up wallpaper, or putting up floor tiles, or, or, or wall tiles. It, it interlocks, and it forms a pattern. Um, you should give credit. So I'll go in, and I'll edit the... Um, index file to I didn't want to do that. There we go.
Um, people have asked me, like, what's the best way to credit the images that you use? Um, uh, again, it's not like I am, uh, I am now or have ever been a law enforcement officer and I'm not holding a copy of the, the legal code looking for ways to have my students arrested. So it's not as though I am going to be a stickler on it. If you make some effort somewhere to identify it, I will consider it good. I might give you feedback and say, well, you could do this instead or whatever. But just make an effort. Put it somewhere on your assignment that you turn in, the credits. All right, and, and I won't have an objection to it. All right. Now, we did notice one thing as we went. And again, that really isn't the Browns colors, but we'll, we'll leave it like that. All right. Um, I actually could go in to the GIMP and turn that into black and white if I wanted to. Um, let's do that. Let's go and edit this guy in the GIMP. And under colors, saturation relates to how vivid the colors are. And if I turn the saturation all the way off, it'll change it from whatever color it was originally to uh, a gray. And if I make it lighter, I can make it a lighter gray if I want to. This is really a, a, a powerful tool. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. There's all these cool little filters that I don't know if they're really beneficial or not, but they're really fun to play with. So for example, I can make this into a mosaic if I want to. And there we go. All right, so you could do that. And you have parameters with that. You can also go and if you want to pretend that you spent hours painting this, you can say, I want to make it look more like an oil painting. That really didn't have much of an effect. If you take a photograph and do that, it has more of an effect. You can give a cubist look to it. and so on. So this is a good application to download and to play with. All right. That being said, this is not a class in photo editing. So um, other than doing basic things like cropping an image, resizing an image, that's the main things that you, ne you need to know how to do. Um, if you can, as a bonus, do some of the other manipulations, that's great. And that's something that you'd want to pick up at some point. And if you want to practice it now, this would be a great time. And I can help you out in lab if you have any questions. Now, one thing we noticed last time, and we noticed this time, is that some of our pages look different in different browsers. All right? What is a web browser? Remember, the web browser is a program that displays your web page. So it takes all those codes and it figures out how to display the page. And it understands HTML and it understands CSS. However, when people make additions to HTML, for example, as they did with HTML5, all right, They don't go back and fix old browsers to do that. They, they put the changes to accommodate the, the changes in the language in the new browsers. And one thing, and, and probably the most frustrating aspect of web development, is you have no control over what browsers your users are using. All right? So for example, someone who isn't particularly tech savvy may have bought a computer that had Internet Explorer 8 on it and have and never updated their browser since the day they bought it. All right, and you can you know you, you can ball up your fists and pound the desk and say they need to be able to update. They need to go in and update. But 
the fact is, is, is there's some people that just aren't going to. And your job as a web developer is to make your page work over as wide a range of browsers as possible. So you have to test your browser in, I'm sorry, your pages in different browsers. So I'm going to open up the Saints, because that's our one win. I'm going to open up the Saints in a couple different browsers. I'm going to open it up in Firefox. All right. Looks okay. I'm going to open it up in Chrome. Looks okay. I'm going to open it up in Internet Explorer. It looks different, and we're not seeing this. It looks different in Internet Explorer. So, in Chrome, it looks like I would want it to look. In Firefox, it looks like I would want it to look. So it's identical in these two browsers. Pull them side by side. Oops. And it's identical between the two of them. However, in Internet Explorer, it doesn't look the same. Now, you as a web developer have to decide. Maybe it doesn't look the same, but you think that that's sufficient. All right? One thing that web developers try to get over is the notion that it needs to look identical across every browser. That's not true, and that's not practical, and it may not even be possible. However, you have to decide if it's workable across different platforms. So in this case, really, I don't think this is very good in Internet Explorer. I would want to get the colors to, to show and reflect the browns colors and I would want to accommodate that. So there's a lot of ways to accommodate it and that is your responsibility. And there's a lot of resources out there that kind of help you do that. But it's your responsibility to test. In fact, I'm doing a very light job of testing here because I'm testing in three browsers. There's many more browsers than that. In addition, there's different versions of browsers which are important. All right? So we have Internet Explorer. Eight here. All right? Internet Explorer 9, it may behave differently. 10, it may behave differently. All right? Now, in this particular case, I know what the issue is. And we talked about this a little bit last time. The issue is that eight, uh, Internet Explorer 8 doesn't know how to handle HTML5 tags. So therefore, any of the styles that I try to apply, any of the styles that I try to apply to those new HTML tags, such as header and nav, Internet Explorer doesn't know what to do with. All right? Fortunately, the web development community is clever. And there has been created what's called an HTML shiv. And a shiv is a little snippet of code that you can put in. And you don't really have to understand how it works. But you can copy it and put it on your page. And I did it with the index last time. I'm just sort of reviewing here, and I'll put it in the other ones. If I put it in my page, it will sort of help the browser understand at least some of the more popular new HTML5 tags, such as the nav, the header, and so on. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put this in all of my pages now. And we'll notice that this page should look about the same in Internet Explorer 8, as well as it does in the version of Firefox and Chrome that I'm running. Um, it should be in the head section. All right. Um, 
this, this, no, it doesn't really matter where we put this one in particular. So now I go and look at this, and there, my page is back to looking like it does in all the browsers. So, if you're using HTML5 elements, which you should be using, you should always put that HTML5 shiv in your code. All right, there's a, there's a place you can download it from, just Google HTML5 shiv, and you can get the code. You can look at the code if you want. Essentially, this code is JavaScript, which we'll talk about JavaScript later on in the term. Essentially, this is code that uses JavaScript to teach Internet Explorer earlier versions how to handle the new HTML5 tags, or at least some of the new HTML tags. Now, we have, yes, just Google HTML5 shiv. And, and it is on one of Google's developers' pages. Yeah. There will be a similar problem with Firefox. Not on our version of Firefox, but on an earlier version of Firefox. So, there's actually a file that we can create for that, which is very straightforward. And what it does is, it tells the browser that headers and you can see several versions of this. Headers, footers, articles, article, um, a side, nav, and section. Treat them all like block tags. Remember, there's two kinds of tags that exist. There are block tags and there are inline tags. Block tags stack just like blocks, one on top of the other. Inline tags appear in the same line, so they stack side to side to side. So earlier versions of Firefox don't understand that headers, footers, and so on are supposed to be block tags. So all we have to do, this is a different fix because Firefox being a different browser has a different specific problem with this. All we have to do is insert this code that says, oh yeah, by the way, these tags are meant to be treated like block tags. And even though it doesn't understand it, we've told it, hey, treat them like block tags, and the rest of it will work, any other stylings. So now we can go and we can put on all of our pages a link to that other style sheet. And this should be before our style sheet. This one, the, the position is a little bit important. Probably won't hurt us in this case, but it would have the potential to hurt us in other situations. Now this brings up an interesting fact, something that we'll come back to later on. And that is a page can actually have several style sheets. Pages can have st several style sheets because sometimes you want one style sheet for a person viewing your site on a desktop browser and you want a different style sheet for someone viewing your page on a mobile browser. So you might have two style sheets that way 
And we'll learn later on in the term how you force the one style sheet to apply for a mobile and the other one to apply for a desktop. All right? You might want to give users the choice of what style sheet they want. Sometimes you'll see like, you know, do you want to theme your, your web page? You can even do that in Angel, right? There's a number of options that you could go to make your Angel pages look a certain way. All right, so you can, you can, you know, there's a standard default and you can go in. And why is that? Well, it just sort of makes it nice that you can customize it. All right. Makes it nice that you can customize it. It also makes it nice that um, if you have certain vision issues, some color combinations may work better for you than, than others. Or some font sizes might work better than others. So you have the ability to do that. One website that, that does that um, is a site for visually impaired people, for a school for visually impaired people called Perkins.org. And you can go in and you can set, you can customize the color scheme that this is going to use to make it more readable depending on your particular vision and vision issues. The bottom line here, what's important here is to note that you can put the same style sheet, or, or I'm sorry, you can put multiple style sheets on the same page for several reasons. And in our case, we have a style sheet in there that fixes some issues that Firefox may have, plus we have our regular old style sheet that, that we're going to use. All right. So as far as CSS goes, we'll keep coming back to more and more CSS as the term progresses. I wanted to introduce you to the basics of it, of putting it in its own file, and survey some of the things that we could do um, with this so we can um, change backgrounds, we can change colors, we can change fonts, we could change um, margins of it, and so on, to make the page have the layout that we want. Anything that deals with the appearance or layout of the page should be handled via CSS. Okay, questions at this point. Now, on to the discussion of our project. Since I know that you've all read the project things that I've asked you to read, and I'm confident of that, um, do you have any questions about any of the stuff in the project? Okay, we did have a little bit of a laugh. Usually when I say I know you have all read it, I usually get a bigger laugh than that. All right, There I got a, 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 a chuckle. Let's talk about our project but in a roundabout way. All right? Your project consists of two pieces, a design and then the actual site. All right? We showed the graph, at least I think I showed the graph. I, is, I get confused sometimes between my different classes, but we showed the graph that looks like this that talks about how expensive it is to change a site or any software as compared to when we notice the problem or when we have to make a change to it. So if we make, if we just discover an oversight or a problem in the very early stages, doesn't cost too much to change it. The further on we go, the higher that cost is, and it's exponential. It's not a straight linear progression. The message of that graph is we want to spend as much, we want to spend a lot of time in the planning phases to make sure that we have really well thought out the problem that is we're trying to solve. All right? We want to make sure that the website does what it is supposed to do. All right? 
What is a website supposed to do? Inform us. Anything else? Work properly. Any other way to... Pardon me? To entertain. Be easy to navigate. Be readable. All these things are true statements. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to say, no, a website doesn't need to be readable. You know, just put white font on a yellow background. That'd be great, you know. All these things are true. And all these things I would describe as sort of means to the end. Because one of the statements was, and, I, and, and not to pick on this because it's a great answer, one, one person said that the purpose is to entertain. Is that true of every website? No. There's some websites that are not intended to, to entertain. Why are some in, um, intended to entertain and some not intended to entertain? All right. Some have information they need to get across. And for some, the purpose is to entertain. All right. So before we start talking about like color combinations and fonts and ease of navigation and all that, I want to talk about what makes a good website. And there really are very few guidelines I can give you about what makes a good website other than to say this, that a good website is a website that helps achieve goals. All right? And the goals have, the goals come from two entities the makers of the site and the users of the site. So, if I'm going to a website about, say, a new TV show or a new movie coming out, all right, yeah, my goal, one of my goals is liable to be to be entertained, right? So, amusing clips from the TV show, um, behind the scenes glances about the making of the show, all those things will entertain me and will help satisfy my goal. If I go to a band's page and they have videos or song clips or whatever, that's helping me achieve my goals. But, as we mentioned, not every site has a goal to entertain. If I go to LC's web page, my goal probably isn't to be entertained. All right? I have been teaching this class for, let's see, wow, how long, 12 years? And I never run against a student that said, you know what, Friday night, I'm going to go home, I'm going to visit LorraineCCC.edu, and I'm really going to live it up. It's the weekend. All right? I'm going to browse that site till 3 in the morning. All right? I never ran into any students like that. Why? Because the purpose isn't to entertain. What is the purpose? What goals would you have in visiting LC's website? To get information about what? What are some of the things that you might want to? Okay, like which classes are available? Where the bookstore is. To enroll, to call someone, to get their phone numbers, to enroll in a class, to look to see what classes you need um, to get your degree in web development or software development or whatever. So you have very different goals visiting that site than you would visiting a site of or Guardians of the Galaxy. All right? In one, you're going in to be entertained and to have fun and to find out about the characters and enjoy yourself. Visiting LC, you might want to find out again about like what would be a good major for me to have? What classes will I need to take? I need to take a class next term, but I work Tuesday and Thursday, so I want to schedule the class for Monday and Wednesday. So what classes are available that meet my degree that are, that are taught on Mondays and Wednesdays, for example? All right. 
So in visiting the site, you have different goals. The users have different goals. The organizations also have different goals. All right? A college, our goal is to service our students better than we could otherwise. You know, our, uh, you know, our admissions, our, our records, they're only open a certain number of hours per day. And they're there, and if you have a problem, if you have a big, difficult problem, you know, you go down and you talk with them. But for some very basic things, to like see what classes are offered on Monday and Wednesday, you shouldn't have to drive down to the college to do that, right? And we shouldn't have to have someone hired to, to, to staff enrollment services 24 hours a day. That wouldn't be cost efficient for us, right? To have someone three in the morning just in case someone wanders in wanting to know when my mobile development class is going to be, all right? So to provide better service to our customers, the students, all right, um, is one of the purposes, one of the goals that the college has for its website. So these goals come from two different places from the makers of the website and from the users of the website. And I would say that plain and simple, a well-designed website is one that it helps the makers and the users achieve their goals. Now, that might be different than what you've heard other people define a well-designed website. Because I didn't say anything about colors. I didn't say anything about navigation. I didn't say anything about fonts pictures, videos, anything like that. I think to talk about those first is putting the cart before the horse. Those are the things that we're going to use to achieve these goals. All right? If I'm a student and I'm looking for something on LC's website and there are hundreds of programs that you could be enrolled in here, then yeah, to achieve my goal of finding out what I need to take to get a degree in web development, there better be a good navigation. Because otherwise, I'm going to have a list of 200 programs and have no idea where to begin looking. All right? It would be very difficult to find it if it wasn't organized in a good manner. So all those things that people call and people describe as being characteristic of a well-designed uh, well page. The reason that they're a characteristic of a well-designed page is because they help both the makers and the users of the site achieve their goals. So, I'll bring up one of my favorite examples of web design. Google. All right. What is so good about Google? Yes. Okay. Uh, you said two things there. Number one is it gave, gives us good information. In other words, it is the standard for search engines. So it does a great job finding the stuff that we're interested in. That is giving us relevant matches and eliminating matches that are ir irrelevant. All right. The other thing is it's very straightforward to do it. How hard do I have to think about using Google? How long would it take to train someone that has never seen a computer before how to use Google? I would think, well, okay, maybe he has used a computer a couple times, all right, but has never been on Google. It's not going to take long. First of all, notice there is one box to put information in and only one box. When I loaded the page, the cursor's already in that box. There's two buttons, all right? Um, Google search and I'm feeling lucky. Um, that's sort of a little, um, once you figure out what the I'm feeling lucky button is, and you have, you know, you can use it if you wish. But other than that, I can go and type in, you know, HTML5 and 
boom, there I have it. It even shows me as I'm typing in. So if I don't know how to spell something, all right, Google knows. There's, there's a famous viola player named Kim Kashkashian, whose name is very similar to Kim Kardashian. And in fact, when she won a Grammy last year, everyone was like, I did not know that Kim Kardashian played the viola. And she doesn't. But that's a hard name to spell, at least for me. And looky there. Kim K-A-S, and it's the third one, or the second one on the list. It still thinks I might mean Kim Kardashian because a lot of people apparently search for her. But I would be searching for, for yeah, yeah, for whatever reasons they have. Yeah. And there I go, and I can get the uh, Wikipedia entry on her and so on. So the point is, is why do I go to Google? I go to Google to find stuff. All right? It makes it easy for me to find stuff. It makes it easy for me to achieve my goal. All right? It does it two ways. Number one is it provides me great, a great service. It, it gives me relevant information. All right? It does the best job of that of any search engine, and that is their claim to fame. And it's very easy to use. Contrast that with a site I, I almost never use, and that is Yahoo. All right. Yeah, okay, there's a box to search web, and they put their cursor in it, but there's so much here to distract me. All right. I'm like to go in looking for stuff for my 530 class today and see, ooh, Adrian Peterson's career's over? Ooh, what else is going on here? You, you know what? I should not even go to news sites for these examples. But anyhow, there's a lot of stuff there to distract me. There's a woman who owns a cannabis club, indeed. Yeah, and then there's an ad here that's flashing in my face. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, you could argue that they have different goals, and people that visit Yahoo have different goals. People visit you, Google have a goal of searching. All right? People that visit Yahoo may have other goals. They may want to see the top headlines of the day and so on. So, but for searching, I would never use Yahoo for that purpose because too cluttered, too much potential for distraction. Which page do you think will load quicker? Google. Because, I mean, the, the files are tiny. All right? They'll download, even on a slow inter internet connection, they'll load instantly. So, when we talk about our project, I want to sort of reframe the notion of web design. Instead of focusing on the appearance, focusing on the goals. And good design is design that helps the goals become achieved, both for the users and for the makers of the site. And poor design is design that gets in the way of that. How many times have you been to a site that probably has a lot of good information, but you simply can't find it? A lot of them. Well, that's a case of a lot of work went into it. However, they didn't do the real hard work, and that is figuring out a way to structure and organize the material in a way that it can be easily seeked out and found by the user. All right, next time we'll get more specific talking about the project and talking about um, 
criteria for good design and, and things along those lines. All right, time for lab. Questions in Ridgeville? Are you okay? All right.